Uh, leading off today are Mr. Richard Helms, who was the director of the CIA during the period in question, and uh, Mr. Tom Karamasinis, who was uh, the deputy director for plans during that period. They are appearing together at the witness table, and uh, gentlemen, I'd ask you to stand now to take the oath. Do you solemnly swear that all the testimony you will give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Before I ask counsel to commence with the questions, since I understand that uh, you, you do not have an opening statement. That, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I have a letter that I'd like to read that came to me this morning from Mr. Colby, the present director of the CIA. It reads as follows. Dear Mr. Chairman, at the proceedings of your committee, on the morning of 16 September 1975, I may have conveyed an impression which I did not intend. If by chance you or other members of the committee got a similar impression, it is important that I clarify the record now since it might affect your line of questioning of future witnesses. When I was being questioned as to the destruction of certain CIA records, I was thinking of the question in its broadest context, namely drugs, bacteriological agents, and chemical agents. I thus answered that there were indications of record destruction in November 1972. I realized that most listeners might have inferred that I was indicating that records relating to the CIA Fort Detrick relationship, in particular records relating to Project MK Naomi, were destroyed. The facts are these. Records relating to CIA's drug program in general were destroyed in January 1973, but there is no evidence that records of Project M.K. Naomi or of the CIA Fort Detrick relationship were destroyed other than possibly as included in the general group in January 1973. I would appreciate it if you would advise the other members of the committee to this effect. I also referred mistakenly to a memorandum between former DCI Helms and Dr. Gottlieb regarding the destruction of records. This was based on a misunderstanding which occurred during my hurried consultation with Dr. Stevens. We have no knowledge of any such memorandum. It's signed by William E. Colby and thus becomes part of the record in these hearings. Now, Mr. Schwartz, would you please uh, commence the question. Uh, Mr. Helms, without going through your pedigree in the CIA, is it correct to say that you started at the OSS, uh, you were with the CIA from its beginning, you were at the covert side, you became head of the deputy directorate of plans, you stayed in that position until approximately 66 when you became deputy director of the agency, you became director of the agency in 67 until you left in 73. No, sir, that's not quite correct. The, uh, the positions are correct, but I became deputy director in 1965 and director, I believe, around June 30th, 1966. All right. And Mr. Karamasinis, you were at the agency in the covert side for your entire career. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And in 1970, you were deputy director for plans? Yes, I was. Right. Uh, gentlemen, um, for your own convenience and for the convenience of the committee, could you pull your microphones a little closer, please? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Helms, uh, were you aware uh, that the Central Intelligence Agency had a capability to use bacteriological and chemical weapons offensively? Yes, I was aware of that. Uh, if uh, one has in one's possession or under one's control bacteriological or chemical weapons, they can be used both defensively and offensively. 
And Mr. Karamazinis, you were also aware of that as of 1970 and before, were you not? Yes. And by use offensively, we mean to include killing people, is that right? Well, they have the capacity to kill people if they were used in that way. Now, did you connect the CIA's capability with Fort Detrick? I beg your pardon? Did you connect the CIA's biological capability with Fort Detrick, an Army facility? I don't certainly know what you mean by the word connect, but the uh, biological uh, weapons, as you refer to them, which uh, the agency was uh, experimenting with, were kept at Fort Detrick. This was a joint program between the two organizations, the U.S. Army facility at Fort Detrick and the CIA. I believe that we uh, paid Fort Detrick for that part of the facility and that part of the uh, materials which we used. Now, did you know... Uh, Mr. Helms, one way or the other, whether the agency also had in its own possession and in its own facilities certain quantities of lethal biological or chemical materials. It was always my impression that the bacteriological warfare agents and uh, things of that kind were kept at Fort Detrick. I realized that uh, the agency had in its possession in Washington and in some cases at overseas stations, things like L tablets and K tablets, which certainly were uh, lethal, but which had limited uh, uses. And recognizing it's difficult to be sure of a negative, let me ask you the question nevertheless. Did you know that the only location of CIA biological weapons was at Fort Detrick? Or was it possibility in your mind that there were such weapons located within CIA facilities themselves? I thought they were all at Fort Detrick. Mr. Karamatinis, did you have any different understanding? Uh, I also uh, understood that they were at Fort Detrick with the modification uh, that uh, there might be a small amount of some of these chemicals uh, within the custody of the Technical Services Division. And in a CIA facility? Yes. Ambassador Helms, at some point did you learn that President Nixon had concluded that the United States should renounce biological warfare and should destroy stocks of biological weapons? Yes, I was aware of this. In fact, I was aware that uh, the matter was under study from the early days of President Nixon's administration because I attended a National Security Council meeting at which he announced that he intended to have this study made. And Mr. Karamasinis, did you at some point become aware that President Nixon wished to have such materials destroyed? Yes. Uh, what did either one of you do, if anything, to make sure that such material in the possession of the CIA, Mr. Karamasinis, or in the possession of Fort Detrick, Mr. Helms, should be destroyed. Are you directing the first question to Mr. Karamasinis well, why don't and the you second take it one first to me? And, or? And why don't you take it first, Mr. Ambassador, and Mr. Karamasinis second? My recollection is that when uh, the order was issued to uh, do away with these uh, bacteriological agents and toxins, that Mr. Karamasinis and I agreed that we had uh, no choice but to comply. In fact, when I say no choice, I don't mean to indicate that we wanted any other choice. I just meant that this was, uh, we had understood that this was uh, an instruction that we were to abide by, and we agreed to terminate the program. And by terminate the program, you mean terminate the program with At Fort, Fort Dietrich. Dietrich? yes. What's your understanding of what was done, Mr. Karamasinis? Precisely the same. All right, Mr. Karamasinis, with respect to your answer that you did know that TSD had in its own possession certain biological agents, did you do anything to have those destroyed? Yes, it was uh, uh, my understanding with Dr. Gottlieb that not only would our program be terminated, but whatever materials of this nature that might be in the custody of the agency or were in the custody of the agency uh, would be returned to Fort Detrick for destruction. Did you instruct Dr. Gottlieb to accomplish that? Uh, yes, I did, but I want to uh, elaborate on that uh, comment, lest I leave the impression that there was some uh, reservation on the part of uh, Dr. Gottlieb. 
there, there's no question in my mind about the fact that uh, Dr. Gottlieb, Mr. Helms, and I were of one mind as to what we should do with the program and the materials. They should be got rid of. And instructions were accordingly issued to Dr. Gottlieb. In that conversation, was Mr. Helms made aware of the fact that there were materials in the possession of the CIA itself? I can't recall. Would you both look at the document previously marked as Exhibit 1, which, Senators, is in your book at Tab F, which purports to be a draft memorandum from Mr. Karamassini's to the Director of Central Intelligence? Have you both seen that document previously? Yes, and I'd like to make a comment with respect to that w document, you, if I may, Mr. Schwartz. Would you please? Uh, the comment relates to a story in the Sunday, in the uh, Evening Star yesterday. Uh, it was a mistaken story, but it does say that the committee provided the Star, or made available, uh, a copy of this memorandum, quote, written by me, unquote. Now, I didn't write I might, the memorandum. I might say, Mr. Karamazin, is that that memorandum was made available to all newspapers as a result of the public hearing. In I'm sure of it. Featured yesterday. I'm sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, I never saw this memorandum. I never wrote the memorandum. I never signed such a memorandum. And I was unaware of the contents of the memorandum. And, Ambassador Helms, you never saw such a memorandum? No, Mr. Swartz. Right. Now, Mr. Ambassador, I want to follow one line with you, and then my questioning will be finished, relating to your comment that you heard early that the President, that is, President Nixon, was interested in getting rid of uh, biological weapons. Biological weapons in the war, I think that we ought to uh, be pretty precise about this, because he was trying to do away with the use of bacteriological and chemical agents in wartime, in other words, well, to destroy populations and so forth. And this was the general thrust of that whole investigation. Well, are, are you trying to take the same position that Dr. Gordon did yesterday, that the President's order didn't apply to the CIA? No, I was just trying to correct what you were saying. You were far too general in your statement of what President Nixon had in mind. That's all. Is it your understanding that the President's order did apply to the CIA? Certainly. After the subject was first raised by President Nixon, uh, was there a study group formed by the National Security Council? I would have assumed so, because uh, when matters were taken uh, under advisement at the National Security Council, some uh, staff mechanism uh, went into effect to draft the papers and the options and so forth so that the President could make a final decision. Uh, did you yourself disclose to such a body such a group, the fact that the Central Intelligence Agency had and had had uh, biological stocks of biological weapons? I do not recall having divulged to this group. In fact, I don't think that uh, under normal circumstances uh, we would have divulged a uh, secret activity of this kind to this particular study group. Uh, did you divulge such activity to Mr. Kissinger, who was then the secretary of the NSC? I don't recall having discussed it with Dr. Kissinger. Uh, did you disclose such activity to President Nixon? For the existence of the activity in the agency and uh, similar activities, I'm sure, were known to proper authorities over a period of time in the particular context of this event that you're speaking about. In other words, that uh, the President decided to make a study of this. I don't recall mentioning this to him or conveying the information to him in that context. Well, let's be quite precise in connection with that answer, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, did you disclose to President Nixon from the time he took office and thereafter the fact that the CIA had a program which included the offensive use, capability to use offensively biological devices in order to kill people. I do not recall having briefed President Nixon on that or several other programs, but you will recall, Mr. Swartz, that he was once vice president for eight years and was privy to a lot of things that were going on in the agency then, which he carried over to the uh, presidency, so that uh, what the degree to which he was aware of this program, I simply don't know. But you, that's the point. You don't know, do you, Mr. Helms, based upon his 
prior service as vice president whether or not he was aware of the agency's program, do you? No, I don't. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Mothers, do you have any supplementary questions this time? this time? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Helms, I'm, I'm uh, puzzled somewhat. It's been established by your testimony that the CIA had in its possession biological toxins that were subject to the President's order that they should be destroyed. You have testified that a special study group was set up by the NSC pursuant to that order and that that study group was not notified of the possession of these materials and you have said that you didn't think it was appropriate to give them that kind of information. Since this was a study group of the NSC and since under the statute you are to take your directions from the NSC in covert operations, why wasn't it appropriate to tell this study group of that particular capability? Yes, sir, it's true that the statute re reads that the Director of Central Intelligence reports to the National Security Council, which in effect is to the President, but they report to the National Security Council. They don't necessarily report to the National Security Council staff. And these study groups that were put together on a whole variety of matters over the years, many of them, uh, they would not have been made privy to uh, secret intelligence information unless there was some specific request on the part of Dr. Kissinger or someone that uh, uh, they should be so brief. So this was the custom, not an exception to the rule. Was it also the, the custom not to inform the, uh, the Secretary of State or the President who had indicated his interest that these materials should be destroyed? Well, sir, you know, I think that uh, if, uh, in fairness, uh, when the President indicated that he wanted this matter studied, he had not at that time made the decision. This uh, National Security Council staff group studied the matter and then made a recommendation to him, and it was after that that he made the decision that they should be destroyed. He hadn't made it before. Well, when he made the decision that they should be destroyed, um, it was given great publicity. And... Um, then a memorandum which appears in your uh, notebook under in, in our notebook under tab T will you will you please uh, it's locate exhibit it number 8 it's number 8 yes sir number 8 in your book ambassador helms protocol prohibiting the use in war of asphyxiating and so forth no if you the tab is on the document itself mr ambassador That's oh i'm sorry Oh, this National Security Council right. decision memorandum. Calling your decision, to, or calling your attention to this uh, decision memorandum, 44. It's dated February the 20th, 1970, and um, it, is, uh, it is directed to you, along with the others, the Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And the subject of the memorandum is United States Policy on Toxins. And I, I read the first part to you. Following a review a United, uh, of United States military programs for toxins, the President has decided that, one, the United States will renounce the production for operational purposes, stockpiling, and use in retaliation of toxins produced either by bacteriological or biological processes or by chemical synthesis. Now, yesterday, when Dr. Stevens or Dr. Gordon testified, uh, he said that he had never received at any time any instructions from, a, from you or from Mr. Karamasini's or any one of his superiors in the CIA to carry out this order, nor had he ever seen the order, and that had he been shown the order, he would have destroyed the toxins. I think that's a fair summation of his testimony. 
He further testified that he read about the president's policy in the newspapers and attempted to interpret the meaning of that policy from the way it was carried in the newspapers. Now, why wasn't this order given to him in the form of a directive uh, to make certain that the president's policy was implemented? Well, in the first place, uh, I was under the impression that when I had asked to have the uh, program terminated and the president's instructions abided by that Gottlieb, Dr. Gottlieb would have issued the necessary orders to his people to see that this was done. In the second place, I, since I, it was my understanding that these toxins and so forth were at Fort Detrick, that is the place they would have been destroyed. And thirdly, as far as this document itself is concerned, I noticed that it's classified secret. And uh, under the requests of the uh, White House at that time, top secret and secret documents were restricted in their uh, uh, dissemination in the agency quite rigidly. These documents came to me in the first instance. This one I'm sure I would have passed to Mr. Karamasinas. Whether the document itself would have gone further than that, I don't know, but I wouldn't think so. So that explains the fact that Dr. Gordon never physically saw the document. But that doesn't explain the fact that you're not certainly not testifying that uh, a document that of this character cannot go to the very people um, uh, to whom it is directed, in effect, the people who had custody over the very toxins that the president had ordered destroyed. Um, well, sir, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm I mean so, I'm, some I'm, directive, some directive to implement the president's order um, based upon this memorandum. Ah, yes, sir, I agree. Should have been sent down to the people who had charge of the toxins. And I thought that Dr. Gottlieb had done this. Well, did you follow up, since this was national policy that had been given worldwide publicity to make certain that your order had been complied with? I never went and searched any uh, facilities, but I'd been given to understand that the program had been terminated, and so I accepted that. These were employees with whom I had been associated many years. I had no reason to believe that they would mislead me or misguide me. Who told you that the uh, toxins had been destroyed? I read about it in the newspapers, in addition to everything else. <laughs> May I make a comment on that, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator? After the instructions were given to Dr. Gottlieb, instructions with which he was in full accord, uh, he went off to carry them out. As I testified a week ago, he came back and reported to me that the program had been, the instructions had been carried out, and he was happy to be able to tell me further that because Fort Detrick was going to be permitted to continue to do uh, defensive research in these areas, he had established an arrangement with one of the scientists at Fort Detrick who would keep the agency posted on the uh, state of knowledge and developments in the defensive area. Uh, he was happy to tell me this, uh, and I was happy to hear it. And that, as far as I was concerned, and I'm sure as far as Mr. Helms was concerned, to whom I reported this, uh, put a period to it. Then aren't you shocked to discover five years later that your orders were not carried out and that um, not only five grams of shellfish toxin was retained, but additional quantities uh, have been discovered in a CIA laboratory? Uh, not shocked, no, sir. Disappointed, perhaps, but not shocked disappointed that your orders were not carried out and that national policy was not implemented. That's correct. But not shocked. No, not shocked. Why not shocked? I think, I think Dr. Gordon answered that uh, in his testimony as I read it in the newspapers. Uh, <coughs> well, Mr. Gordon's testimony was that he had great difficulty with the order and uh, um, that he and his associates decided not to comply with it. Well, sir, uh, you use the word shocked, and it's been used many times in connection with many of the activities of the agency. And I think it is conveying a misleading impression. 
And I would rather say that my own reaction when I heard of this was surprise and disappointment. Uh, but to tell you, since I'm under oath, that I was shocked, uh, I don't shock easily, sir. Apparently not. Senator Tower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Helms, it's been established that although you became aware of a presidential directive to destroy biological and chemical weapons stockpiles, you did not issue a written directive to agency personnel transmitting such an instruction to subordinates. It has been shown, however, that compliance was directed orally and may have taken the form of a direction to Mr. Karamasinis to veto suggestions for CIA maintenance of chemical and biological weapons after issuance of the order. Now, what is unclear is whether your order would have or could have been applicable to such substances stored for the CIA at Fort Detrick or other locations by the DOD as well as any quantities, however small, of such agents which may have been in possession of the CIA itself. Now, the question is, what should a reasonably prudent director of the CIA have done under the circumstances? Well, Senator Tower, I must say that I always regarded myself as a reasonably prudent director of the CIA. At least I tried to behave in that re regard and that re in that way. I did not intend to infer No, I, I understand, but I have to start my statement somewhere. Perhaps a little reconstruction might be right. helpful. Uh, I was dealing here with uh, Mr. Karamasinis and Dr. Gottlieb, both gentlemen and officers that I had known in the agency for many years. I don't know of any more trustworthy individuals in the United States than these two uh, individuals, at least based on my long experience with them, patriotic, trustworthy, and loyal. So when we had a discussion about this, uh, this was as good as writing in letters of blood as far as I was concerned. I have never known Mr. Karamasinis to fail to do what I asked him to do or to come back and report to me why he was unable to do it. And I think that when the chairman a moment ago was referring to um, our surprise that uh, these toxins showed up in a vault many years later, I share with Mr. Karamasinis my own disappointment because, frankly, Senator Tower, we always regarded the agency as a very well-disciplined group of people. I remember that when Vice Admiral Rufus Taylor, who was my deputy for two or three years, uh, left the agency, he wrote a letter to President Johnson. And I remember in that letter, he had words to the effect that he'd never seen a more disciplined outfit in his life, including the United States Navy. After all, Admiral Taylor was a a Naval Academy graduate and a career member of the Naval Service and once director of Naval Intelligence. So I felt that that was a compliment from an outsider, if you like, one who had not spent his life or his career with the agency. So when we learned about uh, this, or when I learned about it, I really was frankly surprised because it was one of the few instances I knew of in my 25 years where an order was disobeyed. Uh, was it a usual practice for you to give oral orders or instructions to your subordinates? Constantly. Uh, even on extremely important matters? Yes, sir. Or perhaps especially on very sensitive matters? Was there, is it policy not to transmit some things in writing? Sir, when the day comes that in an intelligence organization, particularly a secret intelligence organization, everything has to be put in writing, it's going to come to a resounding halt, I'm afraid. Now, yesterday there was evidence uh, produced regarding both the toxins and the delivery systems, and we were shown a device resembling a GI-45 pistol uh, in a staff interview on September 10th. Now, you were asked about uh, these dart guns, and uh, I would like to read from your testimony of September 10th find where we find the following comment. Mr. Michelle asked the question, were you aware of something that could be fairly characterized as being a dart gun as having been among the devices developed in stockpiling in this program? Mr. Helms, I think over the years I've heard of dart guns in a variety of contexts. I do not recall, particularly in connection with the toxins, 
I've heard of dart guns with poison on the end, you know, the natives use in Latin America. I believe the agency had things of that sort, you know. You fired with rubber bands or something of this kind. I have no doubt, you know, there were, was quite an ar arsenal of peculiar things developed by TSD over the years for use in one context or another. Now, uh, during your tenure as director, did uh, you ever consider employing this dart gun or similar uh, weapons against a human target? No, sir, I don't recall ever having considered it, let alone authorized it. And it may interest you, Senator Tower, to know that when that gun was put on the table in front of the chairman yesterday, that was the first time I'd ever seen it. So these kind of things actually remained with, within TSD and were not something that uh, you, were, you were familiar with in detail? I certainly could have seen them if I had chosen at any time. I never chose and they were never brought to me, and so I simply state this, the simple fact that by chance I had never seen that dart gun until yesterday. I have no further questions, Senator Mondale. Mr. Helms, uh, yesterday I believe you sat through the hearings at which uh, Mr. Gordon and Mr. Colby testified and uh, heard uh, Mr. Gordon, in effect, defend the actions of his office in not destroying the toxins on two grounds. One, that they were not uh, chemical or biological toxins within the meaning of the presidential order uh, requiring destruction, and two, in any event, the order for destruction ran to the Department of Defense and not to the CIA. In your judgment, are either uh, justifications uh, valid? Well, sir, I don't want to uh, characterize Dr. Gordon's uh perceptions of uh, things at the time and what was proper and what was improper. I did listen to him yesterday afternoon and I thought that he uh, uh, made a, a very articulate case for what uh, he had, had had in his mind at the time and I have no interest whatever in criticizing him. I just simply want to say that in order to clarify this matter a little bit that as I was listening to him yesterday I realize that not being either a chemist or a biologist and having no competence in either of these areas, I wouldn't have known how to write a directive that would have encompassed everything he was talking about yesterday. So uh, I simply uh, no. can't contribute to, to this except to say that it was my impression, and I say impression because I'm not an expert, that we were supposed to get rid of these things, and that's why I ordered the program terminated, and these things were everything that uh, I thought you could draw a circle around as applying to the president's directive. But when a scientist comes to drawing the circle, he would probably draw it differently than I would. In other words, uh, you're testifying in your judgment. There is doubt as to whether these were toxins within the meaning of the presidential order. I just say I don't know, sir. Even today, you're in doubt? I have heard no expert witness except Dr. Gordon. I don't know whether somebody or some other witness would support him or not. I understand that you have a distinguished witness here who developed these things in the first place and who's going to testify before you, and whatever he would say, I would be prepared to accept, but that's the way I've had to uh, do these things. What, what of the defense that the order to destroy toxins, if included within the order, did not uh, run to the CIA? Well, sir, I don't, uh, uh, Senator Mondale, I don't think that uh, uh, I want to uh, take refuge in that kind of an argument. My understanding of what the president wanted was that he wanted these things got rid of. Yes. And whether they were in the Army or in the CIA, he wanted them disposed of. Well, that, and I was not, in other words, taking a legalistic position on this. I was just trying to abide by what I thought were his wishes. Well, now, the other day when we had uh, our off-the-record uh, discussions, you indicated that what had happened was, quote, a very serious breach of their instructions. Would you still uh, stand with that uh, description? That is the way I felt, sir. Yeah. Uh, but I had not at the time that I made that statement heard Dr. Gordon's explanation. I have not communicated with Dr. Gordon in many, many years, if ever, so that I didn't know what he had in his mind. I simply uh, made that statement because that's on, based on the facts as I knew them at that time. That was what I thought this was. 
In any event, at the time, it's your clear recollection that it was your understanding that toxins within the control of the CIA were to be destroyed. You ordered orally their destruction through Mr. Karamasinas, and later you were surprised to find out that they had not been destroyed. Not only later, uh, some five years later. That's correct. But in any event, this was uh, a uh, breach of your instructions to destroy the toxins. Seems so to me. Uh, what authority uh, does the CIA have for developing this chemical and toxic capability? That I'm now I'm now asking the question uh, in the context of the pre-presidential or order. Where do you draw your authority to develop such a capability, sir? Uh, these activities, as I recall it, Senator Mondale, started back in the early 50s. I don't remember where they started when General Smith was the director or when Alan Dulles was the director. Nor do I recall at, uh, under what uh, rubric at that time they made the decision to go ahead with these things. I must confess that when I became director, I do not recall going back into the legislative or legal history of it. I simply had accepted the fact over the years that uh, the agency was expected to maintain defensive capabilities and be in the vanguard of these exotic things for the simple reason that uh, a good intelligence organization would be expected to know what his uh, adversaries were doing and to be in a position to protect himself against the offensive acts of his adversaries. During the uh, 50s and 60s, there were occasional incidents which uh, reminded us that uh, we must be uh, very careful and uh, stay involved in this kind of activity. For example, I think it was in the year 1957, and I want to say here that I've been trying to refresh my memory in the last 24 hours about these events, and so if I get some dates wrong or some names wrong, I hope the committee will forgive me. I'm not intending to uh, mislead or falsify. But I think it was sometime around 1957, a Russian KGB agent named Stachinsky uh, came to Munich and uh, using uh, some kind of a poison spray or dart or some weapon of this kind, killed one of the leaders of uh, a Ukrainian uh, dissident movement that was located in Munich, Germany, by the name of Leo Rebet, R-E-B-E-T. A couple of years later, the leader of that Ukrainian movement, Bandera, was killed by a similar assault by the same man using uh, poison materials, as I recall it. If it wasn't poison materials and there was a dart with poison on it, I'm sure that the records of the West German government will show this. But in any event, there were two people that were murdered. And uh, it is not that... Uh, we assume this. The, uh, Mr. Stachinsky uh, subsequently defected to the worst German government and confessed to these things and, was, I believe, was convicted and uh, uh, served some kind of a sentence or other. So this is in the public record that this occurred. In the 60s, a West German government technician, an audio technician, was uh, sweeping, and for the benefit of those who are not technicians, there is a device whereby one can... Uh, uh, go over a room to find out if there are any listening or audio devices having been planted in the room. Having swept the West German embassy in Moscow, he came across various microphones and other audio installations in the embassy, and uh, obviously they were pulled out, and uh, the work of what the KGB or whoever put them in was obviously brought to naught. This poor fellow, uh, one Sunday, went on a train ride up to some monastery outside of Moscow, and in the process of this uh, uh, holiday of his, he was sprayed with mustard gas or some s similar poison substance on the legs, as a result of which he lost the use of his legs for the rest of his life. Uh, these exotic uh, matters are seldom in the hands of uh, the ordinary citizen. So one would have to assume that this was a, uh, a KGB or a GRU operation. But with these things recurring constantly in life, 
the agency obviously felt it had to keep up to speed on these, not only to protect our own people against such attacks, but if uh, the worst came to worst and we were ever asked to, uh, by the proper authority, to do something in this field, we'd be prepared to do so. Mr. Karamasinis, could you tell us what you think happened which resulted in the countermanding uh, of your order to destroy the toxins? Sir, of my own knowledge, uh, I don't know what happened which resulted in the countermanding of the order. I don't think there was a countermanding of the order, uh, Senator Mondale. Uh, I think there was a failure on the part of someone uh, to carry out an, uh, an instruction that he'd been given. At okay. least that is the impression I get from what I read in the newspapers of some of the testimony. However it's defined, uh, you issued an order to destroy the toxins, and in fact they were not Mr. Destroyed. Helms, Mr. Helms, I and Dr. Gottlieb uh, jointly agreed that this program had to come to an end, and Dr. Gottlieb took off with, with that instruction. And were you surprised then to find out that the toxins had not in fact been destroyed? Yes, sir. All right. One final question. Who or what is P600? Never heard of it before. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Mondale. Senator Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Helms, I have reread now the letter from Director Colby to the Chairman, dated 16 September, in which he indicates that he may have misspoken the situation with respect to the destruction of records. It's my summary of Mr. Colby's letter that he says that. Uh, when he was being questioned, and I assume that was my question to Mr. Colby, <coughs> about the destruction of certain CIA records, he was thinking of the question in its broadest context, namely drugs, bacteriological agents, and chemical agents. I had thus answered that there were indications of record destruction in 1972. To me, that sentence says there was a destruction in November of 1972, but it wasn't the records that you think it was or that it may, that may have been inferred from my testimony. Can you give us, you were DCI, you were Director of Central Intelligence at that time, were you not? In 72, yes, sir. Yes, sir, in November of 1972. Can you give us any further information in that respect? What records might Mr. Colby be speaking of that were destroyed in November of 1972? I don't know of any records that were destroyed in November of 72. There were some uh, records on the drug testing program which have nothing to do with bacteriological or chemical agents. It was an entirely different thing, I think, in 73, just before I left the agency. But there were none destroyed that you know of in 72? No, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask either that Mr. Colby return or that he give us a further supplement to his letter in that respect, because the second paragraph of the letter would suggest that some suggest to me that something was destroyed in November of 72 and it is not clear from the record what and in view of this witness's testimony I think that becomes important. I think the committee will follow up in an appropriate way. Thank you sir. In the third paragraph Mr. Helms, Mr. Colby says that uh, I realize that most listeners might have inferred that I was indicating that records relating to the CIA-Fort Detrick relationship, in particular records relating to Project M.K. Naomi, were destroyed. M.K. Naomi being the code word for chemical bacteriological warfare agents. Yes, it? at Fort Detrick, that whole project. The facts are these, Mr. Colby continues. Records relating to CIA's drug program in general were destroyed in January of 1973, but there is no evidence that records of Project N.K. Naomi or of the CIA-Fort Detrick relationship were destroyed, other than possibly as included in the general group in January 1973. During the Watergate hearings, you and I jousted a little about what was destroyed in January of 1973, I'm sure you recall, as I recall. Yes, I do, Senator Baker. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Uh, and I won't belabor that point, except to say that I I'd appreciate any further information you could give me about the uh, documents that might have been destroyed relating in general 
to the drug program in January of 1973. Sir, I don't, understa I don't understand Mr. Uh, Colby's uh, wording there, quite frankly. Uh, I have testified before the uh, committee members this week about uh, what I understood has been destroyed in connection with an entirely separate drug testing program. I wish you'd read my testimony. But as far as M.K. Naomi is concerned and this bacteriological and chemical business, I know of no destruction. I think that probably is where we're going to end up in this line of questioning. Is it fair? Uh, would you now testify, or do you now testify, Mr. Helms, that you have no knowledge of the destruction of any records at any time about N.K. Naomi? That is correct, Senator Baker. Thank I have you. no recollection of any such. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't mean to press the point, but in view of the implications of the letter, I do respectfully request that we ask for a further clarification of the point. That is to say, what if any records were destroyed by the CIA relating to their drug program, relating to N.K. Naomi, with respect to the January 1973 destruction, with respect to November 1972 destruction, what I'm after is to find out what records were destroyed, why, and on whose authority. Uh, Senator Baker, may I uh, ask your indulgence that if this, uh, uh, m when this information is acquired from the agency, if there's anything about it that runs counter to my recollection, would you be kind enough to advise me? I will indeed, Mr. Helms, and I fully understand the difficulties that you have, not only in trying to recall the specificity of the events of that period, but also to travel back and forth between here and Iran, where you are our ambassador. I remarked to the chairman previously, it seems like every time we run out of something to do, we call Dick Helms back from <laughs> Iran to testify. But if there is any conflict, most certainly I will see that you have an opportunity to elaborate on it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Senator Baker, um, your request is a matter of record, and I instruct the staff of this committee to pursue uh, this matter so that the necessary answers uh, and information is uh, received by the committee. Uh, I agree you. with you that that, that that question of the destruction of, of records needs to be cleared up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do not allege that there was the destruction of records, but it seems to me that in view of the testimony on yesterday, the letter today, and the testimony of this witness, that the whole question needs to be clarified, and it can be done in a number of ways, and I appreciate your help in that. Very respect. well. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Huddleston. Good morning, Senator Huddleston. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Karamasinis, Mr. Chairman. In response to uh, Senator Mondale's question to Mr. Karamasinis about P600, uh, Mr. Helm did not uh, have an opportunity to respond to that. Uh, have you ever heard of or do you have any knowledge about P600? No, Senator Huddleston, I do not. And when I was listening to uh, the questioning of Dr. Gordon yesterday, I obviously was uh, wondering about this, and then suddenly I realized, am I not correct, that label was written by somebody at Fort Detrick, in other words, by an employee of the United States Army, not by an employee of the agency, and therefore it uh, possibly didn't have to do with uh, the uh, tricky words, rubrics, code words, and so forth that we use, but in any event, I've never heard of it. That's quite possible. I don't believe we've established yet just who did uh, place that uh, label on this uh, merchandise. You said you were surprised or that, uh, that you had never before seen the dark gun that was displayed here yesterday. Uh, you were surprised but not shocked to find that uh, this material had been retained contrary to the president's order. Would you be surprised or shocked to learn that that uh, gun or one like it had been used uh, by our agents against either watchdogs or human beings? I would be surprised if it had been used against human beings, but I'm not surprised that it would have been used against watchdogs. I believe there were various experiments conducted in an effort to find out how one could uh, either tranquilize or kill guard dogs in uh, foreign countries. No, that doesn't surprise me at all. Do you know whether or not it was used, in fact, against watchdogs? Uh, I'm, I believe that there were experiments conducted against dogs. Whether it was ever used in a live operational situation against dogs, I do not recall. Mr. Karamasinis, what's your knowledge? About I, have, I have no recollection of the actual use of any 
uh, of the materials we've been discussing, sir. Operational use, I mean. Uh, I was never asked to approve an operational use of any of these materials to my very best recollection. Uh, I want to add this in uh, fairness. I'm not sure I would have been asked uh, if it were a question of uh, putting out a watchdog in connection with a border crossing operation in, you know, Southeast Asia or somewhere. Uh, I am not sure I would have been asked, but well, how in, in any case, in any case, I have no recollection of having been asked, and I have no uh, knowledge whatever of the actual use of any of these materials uh, against a human being. Well, let me put it this way, then, how low in the echelon of command within the CIA uh, would an individual be that would have the authority to give permission for use of any of these uh, weapons in any kind of circumstance? They, it would have to come to me. So and I would think? not, uh, it, it would have to come to me, and needless to say, I would not uh, feel uh, justified in giving a yes or no on my own authority. I would take it to Mr. Helms. You're speaking now.